Dear colleague, uh, my name is Franck Debier. I'm the director of this place, the, the library, and also the knowledge services of the European uh, Parliament. And I'm very happy to welcome the former members' association to presidents uh, in uh, this meeting today on behalf of our secretary general that wanted to be with us today, Klaus Welle, and of our new director general, Anders Rasmussen, that has just taken over from Anthony Tisdale. It is a very important moment. I was told by our colleague, uh, Professor Wolfram Kaiser, um, that uh, we have uh, now this tradition that was established recently to discuss the work and the legacy and the period in which our leader uh, in the political side, but also in the administration, the president and the secretary general have uh, set their mark on a period of the EP history. So it's about history. But uh, before going to history, and I was told by Klaus that we should do that together, let's stand just a minute in memory of our uh, former president, uh, uh, Lord Henry Plump, and think of him with all our heart. Now we can hear a message from our current president, um, uh, Roberta Metzola. Dear former members, dear colleagues, dear friends, today's historical appraisal event in honor of Lord Plum is the first of its kind in this house. The 70th anniversary of the European Parliament offers an opportunity to take stock of the fact that the European Parliament is, over time, acquiring a history all of its own, that it belongs to us, to document, achieve, and praise. This means treasuring the legacy of former members and the work of the former members association too. Lord Henry Plum passed away in April this year. We remember him as a gentleman, a great European, and a passionate believer in the power of politics to improve lives. During his presidency from 1987 to 1989, Lord Plum invested considerable energy in highlighting the achievements of the European project to the wider world. Adding, as he handed his official papers over to the European Parliament's historical archives, that Europe was no longer a collection of countries, but a more than embryonic entity which had to be taken seriously. He will be remembered for his legendary charm, for his commitment to our shared values, his unmatched advocacy for farming, and his groundbreaking work in supporting young farmers. Lord Henry Plum was the only British national ever to be elected president of the European Parliament. And in truth, we are all sorry that his country, the United Kingdom, has left the European Union. President Plum became a member of this house in 1970, the year of the first European elections. His commitment to Europe was translated into actions, and as a new generation of Europeans, we continue to carry forward his legacy for a stronger European democracy. In 1987, spearheading the expansion of the European Parliament's powers, Lord Plum was the first president to address the European Council. As the European institutions tackle so many critical issues on today's agenda, such as imposing sanctions on Russia gone rogue, or creating a European energy union. For me, as president of the European Parliament, to be able to speak before the European Council at regular intervals is very important. We have Lord Plum to be grateful for bringing this procedure in. It gives the European Parliament a real opportunity to spell out our position to, uh, to, uh, to our co-legislator, 
And as the European Parliament has an obligation to exercise scrutiny, I take that responsibility of addressing the European Council and discussing with the heads of state or government very seriously. In 1988, the European Parliament Prize for Freedom of Thought was given to Nelson Mandela and Russian political dissident Anatoly Marchenko. 33 years on, the fight for democracy and fundamental rights remains as real as ever, with brutal and illegal attacks on Ukraine from an autocratic regime and with cyber attacks by pro-Kremlin groups seeking to crash even the operating systems of this house of democracy. I hope that you enjoy this historical appraisal event of EP President and Secretary General's past and gone, and I thank you for listening. Yes, and now I give the floor to my colleague, the head of our newly established historical service in the European Parliament. We take history seriously. It's not only commemorating what we've done and keeping track like we have in the archive for Lump Plum. His assessment of the situation at his time and what was his look at his own action after but also to take a larger look at what was the role of the institution in a specific period, how the different actors and the different functions in the institution were playing, and what was at this time the type of relation with the citizen. We are also trying here with uh, this uh, appraisal, historical appraisal of Lord Plum to fill what I consider as a reader a gap. And this gap is that we have too little scholarship on the contribution of Great Britain to the creation of and the shaping of the institution. And when I say creation, what Lord Plump witnessed was a kind of recreation of the, the parliament and its function. And there we had colleagues, we had influence from the British colleagues that are still a little bit underestimated and underdiscovered in the literature. So without further ado, floors to the historians. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Franck de Bier, who is, the, of course, the director of the library in the EPRS, for your welcoming remarks. And thank you also, of course, to the uh, president of the European Parliament, Roberta Mazzola, for uh, her welcoming remarks too. And she has assured us that she would have been here if she hadn't had to travel this week. She's on the way. She's not actually in Brussels and therefore couldn't do this in person. Uh, I would also like to welcome Klaus Hensch, former president of the European Parliament and the president also of the former members association and everyone here in the room and online because this is also post-COVID the first, I'm told, fully hybrid event where we'll have participants online, both from the former members association as well as anyone else who will have registered for this event. I would also briefly like to mention that uh, the EPRS has published a briefing of eight pages, which you will find on your chairs, and uh, you can keep and take home, of course, about Lord Plum, which the, and I'm very happy that the author of this briefing is here with us as well, Fergus Aubrey, perhaps you can so I look quickly, uh, you're sitting behind you there, and uh, this I think you're welcome to take back home, and I think it's also a biographical introduction, if you like, to Plum and Plum's contribution to uh, European politics and the politics of the European Parliament. The way we are uh, structuring this event today is we have a contribution by an, an academic, which is also in the online format, because Professor Ladlow can't be here with us for reasons to do with his university role at the London School of Economics. And then after that, we have two shorter contributions also by eyewitnesses, one uh, former senior official and one former MEP and current vice president of the former members association. And I will introduce them separately, one after the other. Uh, later on. So first of all, Piers Ludlow professor, is Professor of International History at the London School of Economics. He's a specialist of West European history since 1945 and particularly European integration, the ECEU institutions and also of the United Kingdom's role in European integration as well as of the, his, uh, the European Parliament. He's the author of many books and articles uh, on the history of the present-day European Union most recently, I think, published in 2016, if I remember correctly, a book about Roy Jenkins' presidency of the European Commission between 1977 and 1981. 
the next book, and that's really important in our context here on which he's working at the moment, will look at the 46 years, apparently, of British membership of the European communities between the northern enlargement of 1973 and Brexit, um, you know, following the referendum of 2016. Professor Ludlow will talk for about 50, 20 minutes, sorry, about Lord Plum's political career in the National Farmers Union initially and as a conservative MEP in British politics initially and then in the European Parliament and also his role in the Democratic Group and as President of the European Parliament, of course, between 1987 and 89. So over to you, Piers Ludlow. I hope that this will work now. Thank you. Thank you very much for Frank Kaiser for introducing me. Uh, I'm very uh, I'm delighted to be involved in this uh, inaugural event. Uh, it's always uh, an honor to be part of the first of a series of anything. And uh, this sounds an excellent initiative. So it's great to be involved in the kickoff. Um, I'm slightly sorry to not be able to join you in person. Uh, it would have been um, it would have been much nicer to have been in Brussels with you. But uh, as uh, Wolfram explained, uh, I have a vital LSE meeting later today that I can't miss. And so sadly, the initial plan of coming to Brussels fell through uh, and I'm having to join you online. What I thought I'd do in this uh, brief talk uh, was look at um, Lord Plum, Henry Plum's uh, background and early career uh, and highlight uh, a number of ways in which I think that then contributed to his role in the European Parliament. Uh, his was in some ways a rather atypical uh, political career, and this is one of the things I'm going to be uh, stressing. Uh, but um, it does strike me also that it's, it's quite an interesting career, and in many ways his early trajectory uh, through his life uh, helped um, define many of the features of his role in the European Parliament. I should stress, I should perhaps stay at the very beginning, though, that sort of Plum is somebody who I never met, sadly, uh, and uh, who I was, to be honest, only relatively peripherally aware of uh, until I was asked to do some digging for this particular event. Um, so that I, I have, a, as Wolfram Kaiser has explained, a long-standing interest in both the history of the European community in general and of Britain's relationship with it, its problematic relationship with it. And one of the features of that interest is uh, an attempt to explore the careers of uh, the many Brits who have uh, played a role in the integration process. Uh, so Plum would definitely fall within that category. Uh, but it must be said that my focus up until now had primarily been on uh, some of the other structures within the uh, community union system, uh, the commission in particular, uh, rather than the parliament. So this is a little bit of a kind of new departure for me. But it's always great when you have a big project like the book that I hope to write over the next few years on the boil, when you have uh, an invitation to kind of zoom in in detail on one particular individual. So it's uh, so it's very useful to have been asked to do this. Now, Plum is in many ways a rather, as I said, atypical uh, politician uh, and uh, an atypical uh, Tory politician. Um, not least, of course, uh, in the current context, because uh, as I will explain, he became uh, a passionate pro-European. Uh, Pro-European Tories are something of a dying breed um, and uh, Lord Plum definitely felt uh, uh, fell into that category. Um, he, as he begins his memoirs by telling us, uh, and as he has uh, sort of used to frequently mention, he is somebody who left school remarkably early, uh, aged 15, uh, due to the circumstances of the Second World War. Essentially, his father needed him on the family farm and on the family farms, I think plural, uh, to uh, help out, given that many of the normal workforce uh, were had, had signed up or had been enlisted into the armed forces. Uh, so he left school at 15, and although this was meant to be a temporary departure from school with uh, with the expected end of the war uh, allowing him to return, in fact, by the war, by the time the war did come to an end, he was too old to return. So he didn't have the typical sort of educational background one would perhaps expect of a, of, of a distinguished politician. His entry into public life and into political life was essentially through the National Farmers Union. 
which is the uh, organization of uh, farmers in the, in the United Kingdom. Quite a powerful political body, although because agriculture plays a less central role in British life than it does in some other European countries, perhaps a slightly less powerful position um, than his equivalents in, in some other European countries. But nevertheless, he, 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 his entry into the NFU was the start of a, a kind of bureaucratic administrative quasi-political career, but one without at that stage any overt party political affiliation. Um, he did very well in the NFU. Um, he rose to uh, be the president of the organization uh, from uh, between 1970 and 1979. Um, having previously held several other senior roles. And he was therefore very much engaged on the British side with the huge task of adapting British agriculture to the challenges of um, the EC system. Um, agriculture was one of those sectors of the British economy that was expected correctly to be most directly affected uh, by uh, British entry. Um, and uh, Plum was very involved uh, with that. So he's, he's kind of European debut, um, or at least his engagement with European affairs was initially through his role um, in the NFU. Um, he didn't during as a NFU politi uh, in, uh, in his NFU phase, he didn't have an overt political affiliation. Uh, his father had clearly had links with the local Conservative Party, and I think it briefly occurs and is mentioned in his memoirs early on, but he doesn't actually join the Conservative Party and become a member until he steps down as, as NFU president in 1979. But having left it so late to join the Conservative Party, he then very quickly found himself thrown into not quite the front line of conservative politics. I'll come back to that issue in a moment, uh, but certainly a, a surprisingly high profile role as he was persuaded to stand as a conservative candidate in the first uh, gen uh, the first direct elections of the European Parliament in 1979, uh, something that then resulted in being elected to the uh, Strasbourg Assembly. So it's uh, he, he's a sort of atypical politician, partly because he comes so late to party politics, as well as uh, his educational um, and uh, professional background. And I think this early career also means that he become he gains an experience of both hands on business. He was an active farmer and he retained a, a farm, albeit administered and run by others throughout his uh, whole political career. So I think that that gave him a, a certain character, a sort of distinctiveness. But secondly, of course, the NFU role gave him an entree into international uh, discussions about agriculture. Uh, the 1970s are not just the period where the British joined the European community. It's also a decade marked by uh, the world food crisis and by a great deal of discussion of global agriculture and the uh, sort of way in which that fitted with global trade. Um, and uh, Plum was very involved in those discussions. He was uh, quickly involved in the work of COPA, uh, the, uh, the sort of Europe wide body of farmers uh, associations. Uh, so he was he would became a, a prominent figure within that, which, of course, meant that he got to know many of the other agricultural leaders around Europe. And he was also involved in the IFAP, the International Federation of Agricultural Producers. Indeed, he rose to become president of that body. So he had a, an international exposure before the before the European Parliament. Now, what this early career uh, meant is I think he brought to the European Parliament role or to his, his uh, decade and a half in the European Parliament a number of characteristics that I think uh, help explain his career, help, um, uh, help um, sort of explain why he achieved as much as he did achieve uh, and also the manner in which he did so. I think I, I'm going to point to a sort of four or five features which I think he sort of translated from this early career into his time in the European Parliament. The fifth is a bit speculative, so I advance it only right at the end in a slightly cautious fashion. But the other four, I think, are, are, are things I would stand by rather more uh, forcefully. 
The first uh, character, the thing that he clearly brought, and the president of the parliament alluded to this in her uh, talk uh, a few moments ago, was huge expertise on agriculture. Uh, Plum turned up in the European Parliament as uh, not just a farmer, but as an expert in the international politics of agriculture. Um, and he would use this expertise uh, throughout his time uh, in Strasbourg and Brussels. Uh, that was in many ways his, his calling card. Uh, one of the first things he does upon arriving in Strasbourg is he joins the agriculture, he gets himself selected for the agricultural committee, and he very quickly rises to become its president. Now, of course, in Britain, being an expert on agriculture, although clearly important um, and useful, in a sense, puts you slightly to the, to the side of the mainstream. Uh, agriculture is perhaps uh, in much of British life uh, forgotten about, not talked about a great deal, and not considered um, uh, very central, despite the fact, uh, despite the number of uh, British farmers. I, I live in Devon, so I'm very aware of uh, the fact that there are rather a lot of British farms and British fields, but on the whole, in wider British life, it tends to be neglected. Now, this is, of course, not the case at all for the European community of the early 1980s. Uh, being an agricultural expert in the European community of the early 1980s means that you are an expert on, in a sense, the central policy of the European community at this stage, certainly its most expensive and its most controversial policy, the common agricultural policy. Um, and you are therefore at the heart of multiple discussions. The discussion about British, but the British budget, of course, revolves around agriculture, but the whole problem about how to deal with the uh, seemingly ever rising in cost of the CAP, how to square this with the uh, budgetary control that the European Parliament would like to exercise, how to square this with the question of member state contributions, etc. So agriculture is very much at the heart of community business in the early 1980s. And Plum uh, brings to the table uh, a great deal of expertise on this, as well as a, a pre-established network of contacts with uh, many uh, of the other key movers and shakers within the agricultural community. So I think the first thing to come out of Plum's background is this expertise in agriculture. The second thing that I would argue Plum uh, derives from his background and brings to the table is a hugely pragmatic approach to politics. He was a late convert to party politics and he was in many ways not a party politician in the conventional sense. Um, he was somebody who was organised, a good networker, a competent chairman and so on, but he's 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 not sort of bringing an ideological baggage to the table. Yes, of course, he had views. Yes, of course, he had opinions. Uh, but he's not a, an ideological politician. In many ways, he's a doer rather than a, uh, than, than a sort of um, uh, an ideas person. I also think he kind of brought to, and again, it would be interesting to hear from those who worked with him to see whether this impression is, is confirmed by their recollections. But from the from what I've read of his speeches and the interviews he gave and, and, and his records, he strikes me as somebody who is kind of, uh, for want of a better word, a kind of solid achiever rather than a political star. Um, now, that's not said in a derogatory fashion. That's actually said in a kind of very positive fashion. He's not a flashy politician. He's not a great orator. He's not somebody who gets up and makes a speech in which everybody goes, wow, that was fantastic. But indeed, for that very reason, I think he could become sort of trusted and respected somebody who had expertise, but somebody who was also able to strike deals, cut compromises, come to kind of mediate in, a, in, in, the, wor in the work of, of, of the Agricultural Committee and later, of course, of the Parliament as a whole. And all of those things strike me as sort of quite 
crucial to his success within the European Parliament. He's not he's not a politician who is in a sense going to bang the table and and force through his viewpoint and only his viewpoint. Instead, he's much more somebody who comes there, not quite as a fixer, that sounds too too rude, but but certainly as somebody who's prepared to strike deals. So I think pragmatism is very important to underline. It was, of course, uh, a characteristic that was often regarded by uh, many uh, countries elsewhere in Europe as a feature of the British. It is one, of course, that has been notable by its absence in British politics, particularly over Europe uh, for the last 20 years or so. But it, it was one, I think, that you can associate with Lord Plum. Third characteristic, which I think is important for his career, um, is his sort of semi-detached position from um, mainstream British politics and in particular from the mainstream politics of the Conservative Party. He was a Conservative um, and he clearly had some sympathy with, some connections with uh, the main play movers and shakers in the Conservative Party of the 1980s in Britain. But I think it's very clear from his memoirs and it's pretty clear from his correspondence, which I went through um, in the Conservative Party archives in Oxford a couple of weeks ago, uh, that he has a pretty kind of detached uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the British Party. In many ways, that's not of his own choosing. Uh, the British uh, Conservative Party of the early 1980s, indeed, therefore, the British government of the early 1980s, didn't necessarily take the uh, European Parliament as seriously as it ought to have done. And it certainly didn't take British MEPs, even Conservative MEPs, as seriously as they ought to have done. And one of the things that comes through very clearly in his memoirs is his sense of frustration of being semi-detached from the Conservative Party. On one hand, he wants to be a, a loyal member of the party. Um, but at the same time, he's frustrated by the marginal position uh, in which conservative uh, to which conservative MEPs are, are confined and, uh, and somewhat frustrated by the failure of the uh, British government and of the British party to listen to their expertise and listen to what they could have brought to the table more, more than otherwise became. Now, again, I think that um, paradoxically strengthens his position in Strasbourg. Um, I think it's much more doubtful whether a politician who, so, who very clearly took his instructions clearly from London and who was doing exactly what Mrs Thatcher or others told him could have risen to be president of the European Parliament. But in a sense, this kind of slightly arm's length uh, distance between um, his role in Strasbourg and between British politics arguably enabled him to focus more on his Strasbourg career, but also to build relationships of trust uh, with his partners in Strasbourg, uh, and, and greater relationships of trust than might otherwise have been the case had he been, in a sense, much more nationally directed in his, uh, in his, in his uh, political focus. Fourth characteristic that he clearly brought to the table and something that is essential for the job um, and which has already been alluded to uh, is a very clear uh, pro-Europeanism. Um, now, this long predates his Strasbourg days. He's a relatively early convert uh, to the uh, to the cause of Britain joining uh, the European community. Uh, it must be remembered that the National Farmers Union in the early 1960s is strongly opposed in the main uh, to British membership, fe fearing that that involvement in the CAP would uh, would uh, sort of lead to the destruction of, of the deal that had been struck between British farmers um, and, uh, and, 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 the, and the British post-war governments. Uh, Plum, by contrast, seems to have understood and felt pretty early uh, that this opposition was silly, uh, that Britain needed to engage, it needed to be involved in the discussion of how agriculture was organised at a European level, uh, not just at a British level, and that therefore British membership was a good thing. Um, and so uh, one of the threads that runs through his early life is this engagement with uh, British pro-Europeanism. And this is very evident in his, in his Strasbourg career. Um, he is 
very much a Brit. And at one level, he brings many of those eccentricities of, of my fellow countrymen to the table. He's a very bad linguist. I don't think he ever uh, mastered much more than bad French. Uh, he has none of the uh, sort of in, in, in some ways, he's sort of very badly connected or able to connect uh, at a European level. But on the other hand, clearly at a personal level, he found it fascinating. He was able to build very strong friendships across national borders. He clearly enjoyed the opportunity to work with and many, many from other parts of Europe and to travel extensively within Europe. So he took to Europe in a, you know, like a like a fish to water, sort of very, very much finding finding the, the place congenial. Um, I think he also um, became a European of the heart as well as of the head. Now, this, in a sense, needs emphasising when talking about a, a Brit. Uh, there were quite a lot of British pro-Europeans who, in a sense, had a, a kind of realised that EC membership was useful and a good thing, but never really kind of felt that this was something that they were emotionally drawn to. I think Plum, by contrast, was clearly somebody who did kind of buy in fully. He was not a European Federalist. Uh, he had uh, different views about how Europe should be organised, but he was nevertheless very clear that Europe should be organised, very clear that Britain should be part of that Europe, and very clear that Europe was doing uh, an important, uh, sort of that the European community, later European Union, was doing an important and vital task. Indeed, one of the features of his memoirs is, in a sense, the didacticism, the sort of effort to use his memoirs to teach the British public about Europe. Um, he writes about his presence he writes about uh, his role in the European Parliament with a real eye to sort of persuading the Brits that all of these scare stories that they've heard about Strasbourg or Brussels are not true, that the European community isn't this kind of threatening, mysterious beast, but is instead something that Britain ought to be part of and needed to come to terms with. Uh, so I, I think it is, uh, yeah, there's a very clear uh, pro-European strand. And again, of course, that would be something that would be absolutely vital uh, to his role within the European Parliament. Uh, he couldn't have done this. He couldn't have been, he couldn't have worked as hard as he could. He couldn't have, have had the career that he had had he not been able to sort of share the uh, the pro-Europeanism that was, in a sense, the, the, the dominant language within uh, within the European Parliament of those days. Final, uh, slightly more speculative point, uh, but I think it might be interesting, and of course it links with issues that uh, Wolfram Kaiser in particular has written about. Um, I, I'm all, I was also struck when reading the memoirs when going through his correspondence that Plum is actually quite shaped by his uh, membership of the Church of England and by his sort of Christian beliefs. He's an Anglican, not a Catholic. But I think in some ways this may, means that he does have a kind of at very least understanding of and possible possibly the uh, kind of sympathy with um, European continental European Christian democracy, which is, of course, such an important strand within the European Parliament and within the whole integration uh, process. He's not, of course, a formal Christian Democrat because there is no Christian Democrat party within within British politics. But I do think in some ways he's a kind of Christian Democrat without being so formally. And if I can end on a very speculative parallel, in some ways that means that he is not entirely dissimilar to another European president of the same era, namely Jacques Delors. Now, Delors is, of course, in party terms, a socialist, but Delors, as anybody who has written and worked on him knows, is very much shaped and driven by his Catholicism. And I do think that this gave him a, a, a way of sort of relating to European Christian democracy uh, that is quite important, despite the fact that, Christian, that France had not had a Christian democratic party since the MRP had died in the 1960s. In some ways, I think Plum falls into a not entirely dissimilar model. And so I do, I would suggest that perhaps that is one final uh, fifth feature uh, of his uh, sort of personality and background that helps explain his European career. But I will end there, although I'm happy, of course, to uh, contribute to the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Piers Ludlow, for this uh, excellent introduction, overview, and these insights into the life of Lord Plum and the kind of personality and politician he was. 
um, and you're staying online and you will be with us for the question and answer session as well after the next two shorter presentations of about 10 minutes each. The first one will be by David Harley. David Harley is a former official of the European Parliament who joined the Parliament in 1972, two years after Britain joined the European Parliament, 75, sorry, which is what I wanted to say, two years, only two years after the United Kingdom joined the European communities at the time, and you were an official until 2010. Uh, his roles in the parliament included being an advisor to President Lord Plum, which is the main reason, of course, why we've got you with us today, and also to the Secretary General Enrico Vinci. And he was also the head of the Secretariat of the Bureau of the Conference of Presidents and spokesperson for President Pat Cox, Secretary General of the Socialist Group at one point, and finally Deputy Secretary General of the European Parliament. Uh, David Harley will speak for about 10 minutes about his experience of working with Lord Plum in the European Parliament. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Wolf Frank, and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak here today. There's quite a lot to, um, to fit into my 10 minutes, um, so I, I shall uh, dispense with uh, formalities and go straight into it. I'm going to try and look, divide my 10 minutes into five short parts. First is another look at the principal achievements of Lord Plum at his presidency. Secondly, a view from, the, from inside the cabinet. Uh, then the, uh, a look at the particular style and personality of Lord Plum, possibly raising this sort of semi-philosophical question as to the inter, interplay between personalities of politicians and their political achievements. Uh, and then some conclusions at the end in terms of... Um, of the appraisal of, of Lord Plum's presidency. Um, it's already been mentioned that two of his most notable achievements were to uh, secure a place at the table for presidents of the European Parliament at meetings of the European Council. Uh, and secondly, uh, when President Metzler uh, referred to that and um, stressed the importance of that uh, down to this day. And secondly, there was reference to the, the Sakharov Prize uh, which was instigated in, uh, during Plum's presidency and has become very much a, an important part of the European Parliament's um, annual calendar. Uh, an, another significant achievement, I would say, of Lord Plum's presidency, which I haven't heard mentioned or seen mentioned, and that is that the first agreement, the first inter-institutional agreement on financial perspectives was signed. Uh, during Lord Plum's presidency. This was part of the overall uh, preparations for the Single European Act, which dominated his presidency, I would say. And the point of the five-year financial perspective, as they were at the time, since subsequently have become over seven years, was to provide the resources needed for the implementation of the Single European Act, and generally to ensure better long-term planning and improve budgetary discipline. That was one of those typical cases where there was clearly an interest for the European Parliament, an interest for the European Union, actually also an interest for Mrs. Thatcher and the British government at the time to stress that her people in Brussels were doing the right thing to ensure uh, the necessary budgetary discipline. I would maintain that possibly, a little bit controversial here, that uh, Lord Plum was the first outward-looking president uh, of, of the Parliament. Um, so... From 79 onwards, we had two uh, very illustrious French presidents, Simon Veil, first of all, and Pierre Frimelin, who had been the president du Conseil uh, before de Gaulle, before problems arose in Algeria. And in the meantime, there was Pete Dankert uh, between the two, uh, whose claim to fame was principally to have led the, um, the fight for Parliament's budgetary powers. But by the time Lord Plum arrived, it was the beginning of a new phase uh, when with the single European Act having been signed but not fully implemented and with the uh, single market about to happen, um, Parliament was gearing up uh, to ex exercise its new competencies, legislative competencies, uh, assent and cooperation procedures. But in addition, Lord Plum was very much of an internationalist, and not only, I would say, because of his farming background. Um, he made trips to Russia, uh, first of all, to, um, to meet up with um, 
with uh, Andrei Sakharov and his wife, Yelena Bonner. It took a long time to get the permission from the Russian or the Soviet authorities uh, to, to meet with uh, Sakharov, but that finally happened. But I was told only the other day uh, at an event following the memorial service for Lord Plum in Monday of, of last week, the story of uh, when he went to Moscow to meet Andrei Gromyko, foreign minister for many years of the Soviet Union, but at that time the chairman of the Doom, the Duma, the, the, uh, the socialists, so, socialist Soviet Republic. Um, and there was another Soviet dissident uh, that Plum asked Gromyko to liberate. Uh, and Gromyko said, it's very difficult with these people. You know, a lot of them are criminals. You never really know which side they're on. There's a legal situation. So he was just playing for time and didn't give anything away. And then at the end, you know, Plum thanked Gromyko for uh, the, the lunch and the interesting conversation. And Gromyko took him, as they walked to the car, he took him on one side and he said, Plum, don't worry about the dissidents. It, there's no interest for you in this man. And then he produced an outrageous anti-Semitic slur. And that was the end of the meeting. So there were the two sides of the, of the Soviet Union foreign minister. On the outside, respecting the diplomatic courtesy, and, and on the inside, not giving freedom to anybody who opposed the regime. Then we've heard about Lord Plum's background. There's the, the graphic story that also came out at the memorial service last week of when Plum was forced to take over the farm at the age of 15 when his father had to go off and fight in the war. One evening, he could see the flames of Coventry Cathedral burning from his, from his farm. And that made a, a great, it was an image that made a great impact uh, on, his, on his mind and on, on, on his future. As regards the view from inside the cabinet, we were, we were a very happy team. Um, some people might be surprised to hear that in those days, the week in Strasbourg was a real week. Uh, that, <laughs> that we would take the 8.30 plane from Brussels every Monday morning, and we'd have a meeting at 11 o'clock in Strasbourg of the equivalent of the Conference of Presidents. And we would continue working through. The urgency resolutions were on the Friday morning, and we couldn't actually leave until Friday afternoon. So this was a rather different schedule uh, from, from what you have nowadays. And another interesting change, and some of these changes which may appear sort of obscure because they were a long time ago, there are also sometimes lessons to be learned from history and, and previous precedents. And one other small detail you might think was that the member of the commission, the commissioner responsible for relations with parliament, was always on the plane on a Monday morning and always present at that first meeting of the Conference of Presidents on the Monday morning. So... And nowadays, it's a kind of middle-ranking official that sort of rubber stamps whatever it is he's been told, he or she has been told to say and what the parliament wants he or she to say. So Plum had a very close personal relationship with the then commissioner responsible for relations with parliament, which was Peter Sutherland. But it was a very, very important part of, of his, his approach and the organization of interinstitutional relations. At the same time, he had a good personal relationship with Leo Tindemans. It was largely thanks to Tindemans, uh, who was foreign minister of Belgium at the time, that the practice of the European Parliament president being able to attend the European Council was first introduced. Another question to ponder, in my opinion, uh, stems from the fact that the number two in the cabinet was a British diplomat. Emir Jones Parry, who went on to become British ambassador to the United Nations and to NATO. And if you look at some of those earlier pres presidents of parliament, not as far as I could recall, under the presidency of, of Klaus Hedge, there was a practice in those early years to have, as the chef de cabinet or the number two, a national diplomat. That Enrique Baron did this, Mr. Robles did that, Simon Weil had done it for the first part of her her presidency, and there's, there's one other who I can't... Oh, yes, and, and uh, Mr. Klepsch also had Johannes Domus as his chef de cabinet. 
So whether or not this is a good thing, it's not done any longer, but at the time, it was, it was useful. It was also part of the sort of double-edged relationship that Lord Plum uh, had with Mrs. Thatcher and the, and the British government. Because even though relations with Mrs. Thatcher were, were difficult and often under strain, we as a cabinet had our links with the Foreign Office uh, and indeed, Emir Jones Parry had a, had a sort of red telephone to the Europe minister, Mrs. Linda Chalker. Uh, and so we were able to navigate and occasionally negotiate our way past Mrs. Thatcher with the support of the Foreign Secretary, Geoffrey Howe, and leading uh, senior civil servants in the, in the Foreign Office. Uh, and whether or not Mrs. Thatcher actually knew about this, I don't, I don't actually think that she did. So, there are different ways of dealing uh, with um, a, a, a difficult head of state. Um, he was very loyal to his um, officials, Lord Plum. In the British Foreign Office, there's this slightly sort of infantile uh, expression. When you say, if you're an official and you say uh, that your minister speaks well, spoke well, it went to an official event and uh, the minister spoke well. That means that actually the minister read out the text prepared by the official. Yeah. Uh, and Lord Plum spoke very well, very often. Uh, except that in the middle of his speeches, he'd often go off on a tangent and recount some personal incident uh, to illustrate his point. But he always found the right landing zone. Uh, and he always kept in mind what the strategic objective of the speech and the meeting was. And when I say that he was an outward-looking president, he organized what was called the World Food Conference in the European Parliament in Brussels with Kenneth Kaunda. I had the privilege of accompanying Lord Plum to Argentina in February 1989, at a time when there were no diplomatic relations between Britain and Argentina, and all communications had to go through the Swiss consulate in Buenos Aires. And we had uh, a meeting with President Alfonsín, where for the first time, unofficially, under the guise of the presidency of the European Parliament, discussions, informal discussions, took place on the Malvinas. Uh, and one year later, diplomatic relations were re-established. Obviously not entirely due to Lord Plum, but that was the kind of thing we did. And indeed, on the way down to Buenos Aires, we stopped off in Costa Rica uh, and had breakfast with Oscar Arias, the Nobel Peace Prize winner at the time, uh, uh, trying to prevent further guerrilla warfare in Central America. So just to sort of reduce Lord Plum as a sort of clubable, affable, friendly farmer, uh, is, is not exactly uh, an, accurate, an accurate picture of the man. He had a very inclusive style of presidency. One very small example, if you permit me of saying it, is the fact that he chose me uh, for, for his cabinet. I was a member of the Labour Party at, at the time, and indeed my previous job in the parliament was chairman of the staff committee. So this was a pretty unusual career move, uh, but he'd sort of taken, taken his soundings, and I think possibly to annoy some other conservatives. He specifically wanted to have uh, a Labour member of his cabinet. But more seriously, uh, I received, after I'd, I published a, an obituary of Lord Plum, or wrote an obituary which was published in the Guardian newspaper, and the former Secretary General of the Communist Group in the Parliament saw this obituary and wrote to me and said how inclusive he had been and how he had always been prepared to listen to the communist group. Uh, and indeed, I remember myself, I don't know if there are any members here who remember Carla Barbarella, who was a <laughs> reporter on the budget during uh, uh, Plum's presidency, he was a member of the Italian Communist Party, and we saw an awful lot of her up on the floor of, of the presidency. So it's certainly true, as Piers Ludlow said, that he was neither uh, ideological nor, nor nationalist. Um, so I believe that he was a transitional president for the parliament 
at, a, at an extremely important time. This was the beginning of the, of the long period when Parliament's legislative competencies uh, began to increase significantly. And he saw his job to prepare the Parliament for doing that. And part of the preparation was to enhance the credibility of Parliament with the other institutions and with the governments of member states. And I think that he put down a marker which many subsequent presidents have followed. So it was a, a fascinating time and a great privilege to serve for uh, Henry, Henry Plum. And they were long days and a lot was happening all the time. Uh, it wasn't that because it was a long time ago, there wasn't uh, a lot of work to be done. Um, but only a few months later, that one had first sensed that this was about to happen, the, the wall came down, the Soviet Union began to, to break up. So in a way, Lord Plum's presidency was the last presidency uh, when the European Union was the club, the comfortable club of Western European nations. Uh, and he, I think, was the ideal person to be there at that particular time. But a few months later, everything changed. And he had handed over to Enrique Baron, who he had beaten by only five votes two and a half years before. Uh, and Europe entered a new phase with a new president of the European Parliament. Thank you very much, uh, David Harley, for these fascinating insights into your own experience of Lord Plum at the time when he was president of the European Parliament. And we will now move on to the second eyewitness, Monica Baldi, who is a former MEP for Forza Italia from 1994 to 1999. And in those days, she was deputy chair, I believe, of the Committee of Culture, Youth, Education, Media and Sport, as it was then. She's now the vice president of the former Members Association and the author of several books published by the FMA, including Overcoming the Pandemic and Present and Future of Europe. Monica Baldi worked with Lord Plum during her time in the European Parliament, especially, of course, in the then joint EPPED group, but also on the delegation, as you've told me, for ACP countries as well. So she will now also speak for roughly 10 minutes about her recollections of Lord Plum. Thank you. Bon pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Dear Klaus Hensch, dear colleague, members of the parliament, dear friends. First of all, allow me, as vice president of the uh, European Parliament Former Member Association, to express my compliments for organizing this meeting in the European Parliamentary Research Services, especially to the director, Frank Deby to the Professor Wolf uh, Kaiser, Head of the European Parliament History Service. Uh, I'm pleased to speak uh, in the first EPRS uh, roundtable, which dedicated to Lord Henry Plum, the late president to whom I'm linked for having shared an important part of my political activity in the European Parliament. He was president, as you know, of the European Parliament 1987-89 and was elected member of the Parliament in the first direct elections in 1979 and we remain, as you know, until 1999. He was the first president of the European Parliament Former Member Association in 2001, which he had founded great, with great vision together with Lord Richard Balf and Ursula Schleicher. Let me hear uh, thanks uh, the members of the association present and uh, especially the secretary too and the British delegation. I see here Michael Hindley, Richard Corbett, Robert Morland and uh, for us it's very important because it means the British delegation is still in the parliament through the association. It means something uh, for us, uh, the continuity. So the great vision to create this association. And I'd like to quote his word expressed two years ago on the occasion of the celebration of the 20th anniversary of our association. I quote, 
My profound satisfaction in sharing in the celebration of the 20th anniversary of our association is tinged with an equally profound regret that my country is no longer a member of the European Union. As I look back over the past 20 years, I'm acutely conscious of the privilege that has been ours of being part of an association which has made possible a whole network of friendships and a wide breadth of cultural enrichment across both nationalities and ideological divisions. That in itself is something well worth celebrating. It's evident that Brexit shook Lord Plumb deeply. And former EP uh, President Hans Ger Petring said last November 28th, uh, as a service of thanksgiving for the life and work of the Lord Plumb in the Church of Santa Margherita in Westminster Abbey. Quota. With Harry, Lord Plumb, the only British president of the European Parliament, we have lost a British patriot and passionate European. As Noe passed away on April 15 this year, at the age of 97, and uh, the European Parliament paid tribute uh, in the opening plenary section on the 2nd of May, Robert, uh, President uh, Roberta Mezzola described him, him uh, uh, as a great European, a passionate believer in the power of politics to improve lives, and uh, repeated today in the video message. He was appreciated by all. It is uh, uh, for his great qualities in various fields, but above all, surrounded by a particular affection from his many family members of, and friends, as I was able to see by attending representing the FMA, his funeral, which took place on 12 May 2022 at the Church of St. Peter and Paul, Collis Hill, Birmingham. After the words of David Clay and Professor Pierce uh, Ludlow, I'll be... I'm going to explain my experience. So it's something very different. I met Lord Plumb for the first time in 1994, as soon as I entered in the European Parliament in the Cooperation Development Committee, where I was coordinator of my small political group. He was co-president of the African Caribbean Pacific European Union Assembly, uh, Joint Parliamentary Assembly a position held until 1999. I was immediately struck by his direct, pleasant, affable manner and the look which, which, with which he scrutinized me as uh, if to try to understand my real intentions. But above all, I was intrigued by the fact that all the parliamentarians of any political party appreciated and trusted him. Yes, of course, he had been uh, president of the European Parliament, but this will not be sufficient condition to have everyone esteem. He had many more qualities that I've discovered over the years. With his affable looks and youthful enthusiasm combined uh, with shrewd pragmatism, he was heavily committed uh, to consist advocating action for the United Kingdom and the European Union. I remember when he told me anecdotes about his parliamentary life, such as the one with the former EP president, Enrique Baron Crespo, who was his political opponent, but also a good friend. And he laughed, remembering the story that was circulating in the parliament about the Red Baron against the White Knight. Somebody said Blue Knight, but it's a White Knight, the reality. And uh, this was very touching because he liked to speak about uh, his life, but even to find an ironic uh, system to explain what's going on and how, how he's alive. And uh, ironically, I associate, he associated his name, uh, Plumb, um, as you know, uh, to the fruit. Uh, this is incredible. And so agriculture, and um, to tell the truth, he was constantly involved in agriculture. Indeed, he was president of the EP Agriculture Committee, 1979-1982, former president of the National Farmers Union, president of the International Federation of Agriculture Producers, president of the Royal Agricultural Society of England, 
Chairman of the International Policy Council on Agriculture, Food and Trade. By the way, I would like to greet here the Director of British Agriculture Bureau, uh, Robin Manning. Thank you to be here. In, in this regard, I recall his concern in 1996, uh, the European Parliament approved the decision to set up a temporary commission of inquiry into bovine spongiform encephalopathy. <laughs> BSC is better, BSC. Uh, he had always been in favor of sending a delegation to gather evidence in the United Kingdom and look closely at how the BSE problem was being dealt with on the ground to verify the high level of progress and achievement achieved in recent 10 months. He was keen to raise awareness of the stringent standards existing in the British meat industry, from the farm to the time of the auction to the point of sale. But he feared that the decisions drafters failed to appreciate the over, overriding importance the British official related to consumer health and to food hygiene. That's very important because he tried to, every time, to be careful that the action could be the reality even of the action inside the parliament in the legislative system. Not really a lot of people that that. So it's something we really appreciate. But the memories I'm most fond of or those relating to the UC, UACP, to parliamentary assemblies, which it shared with sympathy, professionalism, and firmness. He always managed to put everyone to easy, at easy, especially when dealing with more delicate dossiers concerning democracy and respect of human rights. He showed particular interest in the initiative I promoted on the occasion of an assembly in third countries, such as the one I organized in 1996 in Namibia for stopping antipersonal minds. He knew certain local realities well and was attentive when he gave me advice on how to deal with complex situations that I, I could encounter during my various missions, such as my first visit in Mauritania. I still remember his concern when I communicated to him my decision to go to Rwanda alone and at, at my own expenses in 1996 in order to be able to understand what was the way forward to find stability and peace. In an intention between Hutu, uh, in an extremely difficult period for the country, which was experiencing enormous tension between Hutu and Tutsi, after 1994 genocide. And he immediately wrote an open letter, also signed by the ACP co-president, co to facilitate my task. I felt very gratified when, thanks to the European Union ACP presidency, I was entrusted with the task of chairing the working group of climate change as small island states, which lasted two years and resulted in a report that is still very topical today. Lastly, I like to remember his expression of satisfaction when I presented him with the medal for the Union of Peoples at the European University Institute in Florence. For me, it was a real pleasure to be able to work with him and sometimes face difficult situation in the field of cooperation and development development and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica Baldi. <laughs> so we now have time for um, questions and answers. And the way I would like to proceed is that we first of all take uh, perhaps up to three questions from the floor here within the room and give them the participants a chance to uh, respond as they uh, feel fit. And then also we will have a second round from our online participants who are with us in a hybrid format. So I think there are three questions already. If you could just, uh, you will get the microphone, if you could just briefly indicate who you are and then ask your question. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, my name's Robert Morland. My name's Robert Morland and I was uh, a member of the European Parliament um, from 1979. In other words, I was in Lord Plum's group 
uh, in the first election. Um, there are many stories I could tell. I'm not sure I can repeat all of them, but I'm grateful to the interventions so far. Um, I, I would say, first of all, he was not our first leader. It was Sir James Scott Hopkins. And I am, I'm, I have to say, I was part of the revolt to put Henry in as leader. I actually, my constituency was right next door to his farm. For those of you who know England, it's Staffordshire. And I actually lived in the constituency that he represented, because I live in a town called Gloucester, which is in the Cotswolds. So I had a hold over him as one of his electors, actually. But I regularly drove him between Birmingham Airport and his home after sessions, normally to be greeted by Lady Plum, a formidable lady, whose immediate words were to tell Henry, your first duty is to go down there and see what the sheep are up to or whatever something else is up to while well, I was taken in and given the gin and tonic. Um, um, so I had a very amicable relationship uh, with him. Um, I think there are a lot of points I could make, but I don't want to take up people's time. Um, I would say that he was greatly helped by two or three other people in the Conservative group who very much sort of related to him. One, I would say, some may remember Christopher Prout, who then became the leader of the Conservative group after him, and then later on went to the House of Lords and sadly died. Uh, I think he would have been in the 19, uh, 2010 Conservative government otherwise. Uh, but he was sort of a little bit the power behind the throne. He made sure Henry read the appropriate documents which I have to say was a difficult task. Um, the other was uh, Basil de Ferranti, because the one subject that has not been mentioned is the internal market. The whole pressure for the internal market came from the parliament. We tend to forget that. And the British Conservatives were a big part of that, and particularly Basil de Ferranti. We worked very closely with the Christian Democrats, whom we were later to join, on that subject, and sadly, again, Basil de Ferranti died prematurely. Otherwise, I'm sure he would have been a, a second British president of the Euro European Parliament. As I say, there are many stories I, I could tell. Um, I, am, I have to say, I was, as I come from a town called Gloucester, um, I discovered in my constituency I had the deputy chairman of the National Union of Farmers, who sent a letter to Henry, you should beware of Robert Morland, he's a townie. He also is concerned about food prices and butter mountains and things. You don't want to bother with that, do you, Henry? I was confronted with this letter, but I stood my ground, actually. So I prayed I was rather at that end of the party, which was probably the majority of us who were conservatives. We weren't greatly pro-agriculture. But I also would mention Peter Sutherland. This is after my time, but Peter Sutherland was certainly a commissioner we worked very closely with. Of course, he came basically to live in England. And I think he was the president of a bank and the president of the London School of Economics. Anyway, you've heard enough from me. I could say a lot more. <laughs> Thank you very much. To begin with, could you pass the microphone on to the lady on your right, please? So, very thing, thank you for stories, but I need more stories because I'm from Lithuania and uh, I read that Lord Plumb uh, was a leader of the delegation which went to Soviet Union in 1988. Maybe some other members also were present. And this is a crucial time for Lithuanian independence. At that time, we restored our independence. So I just uh, would like to ask to share maybe some details or some, you know, some documents because it was like intergroup. Uh, between uh, Soviet Supreme Court uh, uh, Council and European Parliament. So what is actually uh, happened at that time? And the reason is of that it's also important for Lithuanian history, but it's also important to nowadays events because 
uh, at that time we made democratic changes in peaceful manner and now it is uh, conflict uh, 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 military conflict so maybe this experience could help to find ways to solve this conflict in a uh, peaceful manner because in every newspaper it's Everybody thinks not possible to solve in peace in diplomatic manner. It's just war, just war, just war. So what changed since Lord Plump and his delegation time that it's not possible to solve uh, different attitudes through the democratic process? Thank you very much. If I could invite you perhaps after, the, after this meeting to contact me, and we can also briefly talk about this, maybe I can help you a little bit in cooperation with the historical archives uh, concerning your question about this trip in 1988. Yes, and there's a third question, I think. Oh, well, it's not a question. Just let me make a couple of comments. Um, Michael Hindley, um, I was a member of the British Labour uh, contingent in the European Parliament and uh, let me say that uh, when Henry uh, was uh, contesting uh, the election for the presidency uh, he was much re highly regarded and respected uh, by uh, the Labour members there. There's never the slightest sense uh, of we shouldn't be supporting uh, a Tory and anyone who tried to make that kind of point uh, was very uh, quickly uh, shut up. Uh, in print, it's, you don't, of course, see the person. But when I think of Henry, the word that comes to mind most often is warmth. He was a very warm person. Uh, as a person, uh, as a chair, and as a president, he was never over-friendly. He was never over-familiar with anyone. But you could approach Henry uh, and speak to him, and that continued uh, throughout his uh, all activity. I just mentioned a couple of points that the bringing out. Uh, David made reference to human rights and Henry was a very committed uh, political figure uh, towards human rights and his presidency coincided with the growing crisis revolution that was coming in South Africa. Uh, when there was great, not only disorder, but uh, great uh, disju misjudgments. Uh, people were sent down to long terms, which they shouldn't have been in prison for, and there was still the death penalty uh, in South Africa. And even at short notice, uh, before the plenary session, which has been referred to, uh, Henry could be approached, uh, and given uh, individual cases, uh, and he would send off immediately without waiting, as it were, for permission or a parliamentary decision to back him up. He would react immediately with speed uh, and in the best interest of uh, human rights. Uh, for that, we all admired him uh, very much indeed. The other point I would make uh, is that he always seemed to me, in no respect to other people who've held office, uh, Henry, in many ways, was the perfect chairperson. Uh, he would listen politely to people, he would not intervene, uh, interrupt, but he would uh, politely tell people when their time uh, was up, uh, and he could handle himself in small meetings as well as uh, presidential uh, meetings. He went on, it should be mentioned as well, uh, that he went on to a lot of local activity. He became the chancellor of his local university, uh, and in that capacity, I was lucky to meet him again when he chaired panels. And he had this wonderful attribute, which not all of us share as Brits, uh, of being able to politely intervene without dominating. Uh, he had this uh, very nice habit uh, of someone would speak, someone would speak, and then Henry would say in his very calm manner, of course, it's not for me as chair or president to intervene in this debate, but may I say, <laughs> uh, and he could make a point uh, like that. Uh, I've never seen or heard Henry make a point uh, with any sense of irony or sarcasm, uh, or certainly not uh, impolitely. It must be mentioned as well that Henry had, as far as I could see, or any of us as outsiders, he had a very good marriage. 
uh, much of Henry's strength came from his wife, from their partnership. Uh, he had great pride in his children, uh, and that must be remembered as well. Thank you very much. And lastly, Klaus Hensch, if you can pass on the microphone, please. A very short, but I, a very short, but I think uh, a typical remembrance. Some weeks after my official visit to the Queen, he informed me about the result. She had spoken to him and had shared, said, we were very amused. And I think he was, or he seemed to be proud about the real way to get the Queen convinced, convinced about Europe. Thank you. If I may just perhaps add uh, one question of my own. I think uh, all of you have spoken about the, the fact that Lord Plum was perhaps not a typical party politician, was not a typical perhaps cons British Conservative politician either, that maybe, uh, according to Piers Ludlow, he had something of a Christian democratic um, um, nature as well, although, of course, there wasn't a Christian democratic party tradition as such in the United Kingdom. What I find interesting for this period when he was president was this is the period, of course, also where already you have the big beginning rapprochement between the EPP group and the Danish and the British Conservatives is only formalized in 1992, but I think I would be curious to know whether you think that Lord Plum contributed to this kind of rapprochement and how he did that. But secondly, this is also the period, of course, of the rapprochement between the socialist group as the largest group in the European Parliament at the time and the EPP, future EPP EDD group. And I think the next 20 years or so of informal grand coalition in the European Parliament between these two groups which dominated politics and policy making in the European Parliament then is something to which Lord Plum perhaps also contributed in the way in which he was able, despite the fact that he was a British Conservative Party politician, but because of his Europeanness and the distance to Margaret Thatcher also was able to contribute to this kind of rapprochement between the centre-left and the centre-right in European Parliament politics, and I'm wondering what you have to say on that. Perhaps we can start with Piers Ludlow. Well, th thanks first of all to those who, uh, who, who knew um, uh, Lord Plum and were actually able to sort of uh, augment what I've learned through reading about him with, with personal recollections. It's always a, a pleasure to, to hear uh, from, the, from eyewitnesses. Um, if, if I can respond to just a couple of the, uh, of the, of the points raised, um, I, I think the first is uh, sort of would be to uh, a, agree with Robert Morland about the importance of, of those of some of those surrounding him. I do think uh, it's clear from the paperwork I saw that Robert Prout's role is is quite important. I think it's also clear that the link with Basil de Ferranti and the the, the, the importance of discussions of the single market amongst conservative MEPs, but also amongst a wider group of MEPs, the so-called kangaroo group, is quite Im important. Uh, the single market project, and I've written quite a bit about this, is, is like uh, many uh, successful enterprises, one that has many uh, people who claim uh, to have been there at the beginning and to have been uh, the, 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 the father of the project or the mother of the project, as it were. Um, but I think in this case, it is certainly legitimate to point to a parliamentary role and within that parliamentary role to point to the role played by De Ferranti, but the, the Conservative MEPs more broadly uh, and the Kangaroo Group more broadly. So I think that is uh, important to, 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 to note. Uh, the, only, the other thing I wanted to respond to perhaps was, was uh, Wolfram Kaiser's question at the end about um, EPP, EDG, rapprochement. Uh, uh, and and perhaps the wider um, the, the uh, socialist group, EPP rapprochement. I think on the former story, I do think, again, there is a parliamentary dimension to this. It strikes me that there are two separate chains of events that will lead to eventual um, the, the, the eventual, though sadly not lasting, merger between the EPP and the, and, and the Conservative uh, Party. Uh, one of those narrative centres on Westminster and on particularly uh, John Major's analysis of the situation 
um, of what uh, of the some of the many things that have led to Mrs. Thatcher's isolation and weakness on the European stage in the final years of her premiership. And uh, for that reason, Major asked Chris Patton, who had famously lost his seat in the election, to go and initiate a series of conversations with uh, particular uh, with with the major Christian Democrat parties about some form of merger. So there was a kind of national high politics. Uh, story, but there is also clearly a European Parliament story. I, 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 uh, Anthony Teasdale gave me quite a lot of information about the parliamentary dimension of this, and it's very clear that on on the ground in Strasbourg and Brussels there had been quite a lot of cooperation and rapprochement already. And so, to a certain extent, the high those people at the high political level who were trying to bring about the merger were knocking on an open door because of the uh, of the de facto cooperation that had already developed the parliamentary level. But again, I would be uh, very interested to hear uh, recollections of those who are actually there on that idea. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Monica Baldi. Yes, I think, uh, first of all, uh, Lord Plumb was, uh, I mean, he was British, but he was a passionate European. So he made a fantastic work in uh, Great Britain. He was very well recognized in agriculture field. He was very strong in his uh, constituency. That's something uh, uh, very important because he could have a voice, not only in the national uh, system, but even in the European Parliament. And uh, first of all, I was really impressed because uh, he was very well known from everybody. He, that everybody knew him and everybody respect him. So it means even that he, um, he was able to build this kind of relationship that it is not easy to find in the European Parliament, even if in that period, you're right, there were few member states. Uh, uh, when I came inside, there are, there are just 15, uh, 13, uh, sorry, 12 uh, member states, and then uh, grow to 15 member states. When, for the first time I met him, I was in a small group called Forza Europa, for Europa was only an Italian delegation. So here there was no respect inside the parliament, but as, as you know, um, uh, you cannot have a group only uh, of a nationality. So I, for me, it was something uh, I can see first, uh, uh, the Irish too, uh, they were very open with us. It was very difficult in that period. It means that Lord Plumb had a fantastic vision um, it's very difficult when we speak about a politician and we think only to put in a, a square, in a small square, you say this is a politician has to uh, think about that. No, Lord Plumb was more, he had a vision, but he was very strong because uh, he had even his constituency with him. And uh, when I spoke, uh, um, I started speaking about uh, the uh, former member association, that it means even that the action for him is not only one in that moment, but something that can grow, can go on. Uh, you don't have to stop the action in just uh, a, a kind, uh, I mean, uh, you speak about a resolution, uh, something like, no, you have to go on to continue your action. So he respected a lot of people doing this kind of stuff. And I was really impressed with, it, with me, for instance, uh, he, he treated me like a nephew, so he said, I am your uncle because uh, I have to explain you something. This uh, It's okay, this no, but uh, it means uh, he respected a lot my way to do. This is something uh, you grow, and uh, for me, it's something uh, special. And so when you speak about uh, uh, how Christian Democrat, uh, um, Popular Party, etc., for us, uh, for instance, from Force Europa, then we arrived in a Union for Europe, Europe group, and then in the Popular Party. I mean, we have five years where we went inside three kinds of group. And when we were in the Popular Party, I have to thank Lord Harry Plumb. I have to thank Paul Rubik here. I have to thank some friends. I can say, uh, really, um, they understand exactly the importance of the vision. And even inside the European Parliament, the great group 
popular and socialist, but even the respect uh, of each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. David Halley has agreed to keep some comments for the end. So my colleague Gilles Peter uh, has got maybe up to two questions now from the online floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Wolfram. Um, we have an intervention from uh, Mr. Leslie Huckfield. He was MEP from 1984 to 1989. Uh, and he asks about um, uh, Lord Plum's relation with uh, Arthur Cockfield, uh, which was called the father of the single market, and, um, M and uh, Lord Plum's relation uh, to that person and his contribution to the single market. Now, uh, Wolfram, if you would allow it, um, Mr. Huckfield would also like to take the floor himself digitally. I don't know if that will, if we sorry, have time we for that. We don't have time for that, I'm afraid. Oh, so of there's course. a second question. Right, th that was the only question, okay. basically. Well, then Thank you. Uh, we, we have very little time we, because we need to uh, finish punctually. So, uh, Frank, you wanted to say something? Come in on. Just uh, an additional question. His relation to the U.S. Um, because, uh, of course, at the end of the Cold War, it, it was very central for an, anyone in, in politics. Uh, and it's not very covered in uh, what we, you can read about him. And I'm sure that he was involved uh, seriously also in transatlantic thinking, uh, etc. This is a little bit lost in what we have managed to together. Also, it's not lost in the memories. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this very important question. Uh, perhaps we can go back to Piers Ludlow. Uh, Piers, if you can be brief, because we only have very little time left, unfortunately. Well, I think I can be very brief because I, I'm not certain I can add very much on either. Um, so the relationship with Cofield, um, well, they came from the same party. I don't, it's not clear to me that the uh, sort of, uh, I've not seen any evidence of a, a of a very close link, but I would love to be contradicted and told otherwise. So, um, so, so that's that's a confession of ignorance rather than a, a real answer to the question on transatlantic relations. Again, I, I've not come across very much on that, but uh, but again, he may have he may have been important. He seemed to have had quite a sort of uh, as, as he made a series of quite successful visits to to the United States, and he had he had pre existing contacts because of his international agricultural roles there too which uh, seem to have played some importance but again i've not come across a, a lot of material on that so i would uh, i would love to learn more rather than being able to provide answers thank you very much david is this the sort of the parting word okay well th thanks everybody very much i'd just like to um end with a with a metaphor um that the very last official visit that Lord Plum paid uh, before standing down as president uh, was in that strange period between the European elections and the constitution of the next parliament. So in June uh, 1989, and he paid an official visit to Sicily, uh, which, not surprisingly, was organized by the Secretary General of Parliament at the time, en Enrico Vinci. Um, <laughs> And so there was an evening in the, the Vinci family house uh, overlooking the Bay of Messina um, when all the notables of, of Sicily and the regional authorities were there and the government sent down their representatives. And one, look, one could look down by the light of the moon on the town of Messina where just a little less than 40 years previously Britain had decided not to send a representative to the conference that founded the European Union. And it seemed to be a fitting moment for me to remind Lord Plum that things had moved on and that Britain was now a full-hearted member of the European Union at last. Th thank you very much.
it is no, it is no longer, of course. But thank you very much uh, to all of the panelists for contributing to what I think has been a successful and interesting event and the first event of its kind. Uh, thank you to all of you who have participated here in the library and also online for taking an interest in this event as well and to Frank for sharing it. Uh, and the last thing that remains to be said is, of course, that my hope is that the next such event will not take place for a very, very long time. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs>